And today we're going to do an interview for you, and it's going to be a good one. I think you guys will like it, but really kind of break down how mobile games are coming to market, what this might mean for the bigger picture, because there's a lot of different projects and uh, tokens that could play into this. So we'll dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back in to TechPath. All right, joining me is Ian Bentley and Scott Herman. The guys over at Wagme, I've had a chance to meet you guys in person, so it's good to have you back on the show. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having us, Paul. Great to see you again, Paul. Yeah, all right, so let's get into a little bit about Wagme in general in terms of your update, where you guys are today, size of community, developers. All, give me kind of a rundown where you are right now. Uh, yeah, so size of community is great. I would say collectively across all of our socials, we're about 60,000. Uh, I think our Twitter just hit 53,000 this week. And as far as playing the game, our beta is doing very well. We're in a closed beta right now, so we've tried to keep it around 500 to 600 players because a lot of what we're doing is we're testing the boundaries of what the characters can do, balancing the characters, but most importantly, what we've been testing is credit card transactions. So in our beta right now, our players are actually to make all in-game purchases, whether it's microtransactions or the actual NFT card packs with a credit card. So all of that is working right now. Now we are a free to play game. So as you're playing the game, you will earn the characters that you can put on your team to do the battles. But of course, if you want to level up faster or get more cards that you might not have yet because you're still opening up war chests, you can go and buy those packs in the store. So we've been doing live battle royales just like this on our YouTube channel for the past few months. I actually did one last night. I actually have another one today after this call um, where you, we'll get like five or six creators together and then our entire community will join these live streams and we'll battle back and forth for an hour and what it does is a few different things, right? It allows us to showcase the game live, um, showcase all the features, and then our uh, senior product lead, Esteban, will actually join these battles too because they really help him not only find glitches or bugs that need to be fixed, but as he starts to see the different uh, strategies that some of the users are doing, uh, he's able to go in and then start nerfing and buffing certain characters to, to continuously balance out the game. That's the hardest thing when it comes to a game when you have a lot of characters mm -hmm. is making sure you can balance them all so there's not just one team that's the meta, right? You want to have different teams that utilize different strategies to make the game fun. So you guys on your Twitter, you had uh, you did your announcement. You had the September 27th drop. Uh, we were trying to get you on last time. We had a little bit of technical difficulty, but... The uh, first of all, how did it go? What was the your expectations versus how the over project overall project actually went to market? Can maybe Ian, you could address that? Yeah, um, you know, to be honest with you, it, it didn't go as well as we expected it to. Uh, we have a lot of different catalysts that we've been working through, and you know, it's trying to put a round uh, around peg in a square hole at the moment. Um, you know, the, the problem with the bear market right now is everybody is shifting and there's a lot of, there's really not that liquidity that we had six months ago, a year ago, especially in the NFT market. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that we're also doing that I think is going to, it, it's going to do very well. It's just going to take a little bit of time is the fact that we've created a double deflationary mechanism for this NFT drop. So for example, we're trying to bring back the nostalgia of opening up a pack of baseball cards or Pokemon cards, where you have that pack, but if you open it, the pack is worthless. You have to throw it away. So this collection on OpenSea is going to be a deflationary where we're burning the NFT in order to open up the 32 cards that are playable within the game those cards are going to be on IMX. So those are on L2 that are playable within the game currently. Uh, so it's a dual chain type mechanism. And then the other cool thing that we have having to do with the NFTs within the game is those are also deflationary. So okay. in, in order to upgrade your cards from rare to epic to legendary, you're burning five cards per level, which means that if you start with a common and you get all the way to a legendary, there's 25 or 125 cards that essentially are burned which we feel is going to aid in the rarity of the collection and also you know, give gamers an opportunity to not only play the game, level up their cards, but it brings in that collectability of the digital collectibles. Uh, those are called NFTs. We don't like to use that word too much. Um, so 
you know, we feel that this is a, a long term, uh, long term mint. I mean, it's a continuous go. Um, we are about to be releasing a lot of videos having to do with the pact being opened, um, showing people as opposed to telling people is also a very important aspect of this mint. Uh, so this is just something that, you know, I think that we have a lot of the DGENs that yeah. are just coming in and expecting the same old PFP. And it's not that collection. So we have a little bit of work to do as far as explaining to the consumers that this is a very unique collection. And it's also something that you can actually play within a game currently, which doesn't exist that much in Web3. But I want to go back to kind of the technical aspect of how you achieved the leap into OpenSea, because there was a little bit of some hoops that you guys had to jump through. Maybe you could talk to that and how you did it and that process in general? Yeah, so so it's constantly give and take with the technology that you have to work with. You know, if we're talking about this a mint a year from now, it's going to be, you know, different technology. Um, it, it, right now, the way the OpenSea Mint worked, because we were actually featured on OpenSea, is we had to leverage what they had to do as far as the Mint was concerned. Right. So they didn't have L2 on IMX quite yet. So therefore, you know, having to do the L1 for the actual packs and then creating an entire process where somebody then goes and locks up their or, or decides to open up their pack on our dashboard to reveal the 32 cards. And, you know, we had to basically have it a two-step process based off of the technology, right. but so, we, you know, we're rolling with it. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about IMX because this is one of the, I guess, the knocks on IMX in terms of this closed ecosystem within the marketplaces themselves. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? What's your opinion on one, how your strategy is going to go forward, and also just the whole idea of Web3 and mobile gaming in general on the IMX uh, ecosystem. Do you think there are going to be continued limitations? What's your opinion? Well, I think as we move forward, especially with our game, because we're incorporating the Passport relatively soon here, but as far as being able to get into the ecosystem, everything is done under the hood. So, for example, even with the current beta that we have, uh, it's available on Android, you go to the Google Play Store, download the game, you log in with one of your, your email address or one of your socials, and all of that wallet creation, custodial wallet, all that stuff is done yeah. behind the scenes. The player doesn't even know that it's a quote-unquote crypto game until we educate them on how to start claiming their NFTs if they want to buy, buy more, sell them, or trade them. I don't think the entry to getting Web2 people into Web3 games is letting them know how much their NFTs are worth. Yeah. What I would like to do in our game is have them be playing for a little bit and then introduce them and say, hey, did you know that you can actually trade cards with your friends? Here's how you do it. And then yeah. that's how we introduce them to the secondary market. And then while they're there, they'll be like, oh, wait, why are there cards for sale? I have some of these cards. Are my cards worth okay. that much? And then they'll get introduced to the secondary market that way. But for a gamer, it's community building is more important. And being able to trade back and forth, I think, is, is what's going to be most appealing to them. And honestly, eventually, Immutable, the marketplace, will all be built in-game. So yeah. right now, it's a little separate. But as we move forward and the technology continues to innovate, everything's going to be done in-game. It's just going to feel like normal gameplay. Yeah, so I, I see a couple of strategies there that I would agree with to a certain extent. You know, the traditional, let's, we'll just call it Web2 gaming in general, the adoption curves that are going to come in from traditional gamers that may say, okay, I, you know, I like the game, I'm going in, I like mobile gaming, etc. And then they discover, oh, this is actually a blockchain game or it's a Web3 game, and there's some opportunities here. So in that kind of scenario, when you have that kind of onboarding route, the platform probably isn't as big of a deal. But if you've got traditional crypto people that are saying, okay, I'm looking for the Web3 mobile game that I can help my friends start to leap into, they're a little bit more interested in, hey, can this go cross-platform? Can this go into some other blockchains, et cetera, especially when you look at interoperability. So, I mean, there's two, there's two growth opportunities here. It sounds like you guys are, are planning to grow more from traditional gamers more so than the Web3 gamers that are in the markets today. Is that true? I would say that's incredibly true. Our main focus has always been 
going after the 96 or 97 percent of the world that's not in crypto as opposed to yeah. only three percent that are and if you think about the demographics of people that are in crypto that are playing games most of them are not gamers they're speculators they're investors yeah. They're not mm -hmm. there to actually have a great time and play the game. It's either you have all of these influencers or content creators that are trying to make a name for themselves, or you have these DGENs that are trying to figure out how to pick up how something as cheap as it and it flip yeah. it, right? It's, it's a different narrative. And we've always just been focused 100% on saying game first and no friction whatsoever. It's not like people are going to go, oh, well, Wag Me Defense is available. I can just freely trade within their marketplace. But no, I'm going to go to 75 other marketplaces to see if I can get a better deal. Usually what's going to happen is, you know, people are, number one, going to understand that once it's listed one time, it's propagated the same price everywhere. Right. Um, but at the same time, you want to make it so that it's all within its own ecosystem. So our philosophy is not necessarily going after your Web3 Maxis, although we are a Web3 company, we have a very, very loyal community. Uh, people are believing in what we're saying and doing. Um, and at this point now, in order for us to scale and be what we believe is one of the companies that are number one, going to market as far as global launch is concerned, and secondly, being able to onboard people, a lot of people, uh, yeah. you have to not have the talk of NFT and crypto and stuff like that. It all yeah, needs to I, be just but, like- I, but Ian, I would I would kind of push back on that because I feel like yes, in the early stage, that's that's going to be the way that we're going to look at adoption. But because if you're selling on eBay, most people are probably selling on OfferUp. They're also selling over on if they're, let's say they're a watch guy like me, they're selling on Chrono Twenty Four, and wherever it plays is where I'm going to go. But I want the ability to move my asset in and around those markets. So I guess my question is for gamers. Today, it probably doesn't matter. Yes, we need adoption. But at some point, people are going to start figuring this out. I've got some young kids and they're starting to ask these questions about these assets, you know, digital skins and the value. And eventually I said, well, what would you do if you could take that Pokemon and sell it on, you know, another platform or another game inter you know, interface or take it into another game? They're like, what? I can do that? Well, not yet because we, you know, we have these kind of limitations. So I guess for me, when I look at IMX, I just look at, you know, there's a limited amount of, of featured marketplaces here and not exploding really in general when I think about games and where the, the growth is going to be. I still look at, you know, obviously things like Avalanche, uh, Solana, you know, some of those other platforms that are eventually going to grow. So is this in your roadmap at some point to maybe look at some alternatives there? I, I mean, I, do you feel trapped in IMX at all? Well, we also they also have their Polygon partnership that they announced a few months back, and Polygon sure. is well, known IMX for Polygon kind of synonymous, yeah. yeah, for sure. So, I mean, if there's any kind of cross chain interoperability, we're open for it. To be yeah. able to have your assets free, you know, that's a whole part of the ethos. Mm -hmm. It's the decentralization, sure. be able to take your assets anywhere you want. Um, we're going to let the chains dictate interoperability at that point. Um, I don't disagree with you. I think, you know, if we fast forward five years from now, uh, we're not talking about the differences of chains. I do think one of the issues, though, is gas, uh, where Immutable just doesn't have any gas. Yeah. Even Polygon got small bits of, of your gas fees. Let the chains figure that out. For yeah. us, we will be able to, you know, we'll, we'll go with whatever makes sense Deal to the with consumer. That as it gets there. All right, so I, I would agree, Ian, on that one. Um, okay, so a couple other things that are happening here. Google, Apple, uh, obviously you guys have worked with them on rolling your game out. This is a big part of your strategy. Uh, any roadblocks that you're seeing there in that? Because obviously we know the Apple tax and what that's gonna look like. How are you guys dealing with that? The way it works with, with Apple um, is they just want there to be a fair playing field as far as money that they can make with an app versus something you sell. Wait a minute, you just said fair fair playing field with okay. Apple? Correct. So, you can, so here's here's a problem with, with crypto is you can sell something that is cheaper and undercut Apple and promote that on your website and then take that NFT and play it into the game. Okay. That's against the terms and conditions for Apple. So if well, that's you called play the marketplace. By, that's the market, that's uh, the market. Well, that's how markets work. Secondary market. Yeah. Well, I'm just so, saying that's how markets work. You know, you still have a closed ecosystem within the Apple scenario. I just, you know, I'm not a big, well, I'm, even though can, I use Apple, I'm not a big Apple fan in the terms you of, can, I don't, I want creators to be able to create 
build and, and, and be able to use these in all sorts of places and not get, you know, kind of hoodwinked into, you know, one of the biggest, you know, scams out there. Oh, well, you can still go to the secondary market if you want to sell it for less than what you buy it for on Apple. I mean, that's up to you. All Ian is saying is when we spoke to Apple and we discussed having NFTs in our game, mm -hmm. they just said, hey, if this NFT pack on your game costs $5 on your website, it better cost $5, $5 on Apple and it better game. cost $5 on Android. So it's the initial purchase that they're worried about. If you buy it for five bucks and then go to a secondary market and want to sell it for two, and lose mm -hmm. three bucks, then I mean, great, you can do that. Apple doesn't care as long as. Man, it's a initial... good thing Uber Eats did not do that with uh, all the millions of restaurants that they have out there, because that's exactly <laughs> the model that they're using right now. Is they, you know, a restaurant will sell less on their own website than what they'll sell inside of Uber Eats. So I don't know. I just look at that and I, I feel like this is a broken model. It's a catch twenty-two. Well, what yes. you're 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 paying Apple to have the security for this for the users to have yeah, the ability a marketing to use engine for sure and people can go to one place to download the game yes. like either that or google um but you know if you think about it if you go to other different platforms xbox playstation they all charge a fee um the majority of the companies are focused on the technology and the speculation you have a handful of other companies that are just focused on, you know, just making sure that the graphics are so good that their story is attached to it. Um, because we believe the why people will want to buy things within our game and the characters is because of the emotional ties to the actual characters, mm -hmm. as opposed to just the NFTs, opposed to just the speculation, as opposed to just the technology. So. Um, our focus has been on the story as well. Okay, so I and, and, and Scott, I kind of push back on that as well a little bit, only because if you're going the direction of Web 2 traditional gaming, I mean, I, I'm getting mixed signals here because I look, at, you guys are also over here like on Next Crypto Gems. That's a different, that's a different look. And, and does that give you a bad look if, if you're trying to avoid that pitfall? I mean, you know, we talked about this early in the, before I came on live, I do advisory roles and I work with a company that does um, in-game ordering for food. And when they go present their package to restaurants, they don't tell the restaurants that this is a blockchain product. You know, it, they don't even get into that. So I guess my question is, is, does that send mixed signals out there into the market? Or are you just trying to cover both bases? What, what's the strategy there? Oh, can I take so this one? one? Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, yeah. So we we are a Web3 game and we don't sure. shy away from that. But, you know, it's interesting. Epi episode two of the show is when we got introduced. Mm -hmm. And the first challenge on episode two was we had to convince a whole room of people that were called no coiners. People had no idea what crypto was. We had to explain crypto terminology to them. And by <laughs> luck of the draw, me and Ian got NFTs. It was perfect. Oh, uh, there man. was Web3, blockchain gaming, and Bitcoin. So when we when we saw our competitors, we're like, good luck with that because we're a crypto game and we have to explain NFTs. And yeah. me and Ian did a did a two-minute presentation where, you know, we obviously had some time to prepare and we figured out as Ian is explaining what traditional mobile games are like, I was just drawing pictures on the board. So like mm -hmm. I drew a picture of a phone games, spending money, and then a trash barrel. And then Ian's like, if you're spending money on a, on a phone right now on a game, you're pretty much yeah. throwing that money in the trash. Yes, sure. you're getting entertainment value, but if that game ever gets deleted or you stop playing, you can never pull that money out. You literally see the light bulbs. Like if it was a Looney exactly. Tunes cartoon, yes. you could see the light bulbs go ding, 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 ding. On but you head. know, Scott, but Scott, you, you look at that and that is you getting a chance. It's like you know, I do these weekend you know, webinars with high net worth individuals. Same kind of scenario plays out. They're very skeptical about crypto. The minute you start explaining what bankless is, what being able to see decentralized finance is, the game is over. They're in. I think that's going to happen here in this marketplace in terms of the gamers. Right now, NFT is just a bad word because of you know, the allure that the market has brought, but these gamers at the end of the day, they will want to own their digital assets. There is no doubt about this. I do want to address your, your question. Your question was, you know, how do you identify yeah. in, in today's world? Do I identify as a Web 2 company or a Web 3 company? Yeah. Um, you know, right now, it's it seems like it's a little bit of a mishmash, but when yeah. we go to global launch, 
we are we we are, we already currently have a game division and we have our web three division. So we already have two divisions within our company. The game focuses on the game. The focus on the development of the game, make sure the game is where it needs to be, make sure that the dev and the, and the, the code is ready to go for global launch, that it's yeah. smooth, that if there's a bug, that the updates can be updated as opposed to just downloading an, a new app. So when we go global launch as well, we are going to have Web2 user acquisition strategies. Yeah. Okay, So Listen, it doesn't I- necessarily... I agree with you, Ian, because we, we kind of live in that same space. We're a media company that has to live in an old world media that doesn't yep. really understand the future of what blockchain will do to content. And you can't get them there quick enough. It just will take too long. It's the same thing you guys are dealing with. So I understand you have to live in both worlds. I get that. Uh, obviously, we have committed out and said, hey, listen, we think that blockchain is going to be the future of media. We think it's going to be the future of tokenizing all kinds of assets out there. Gaming, media, obviously we'll get into financial instruments as well, all that. So I think you're on the right. I'm just kind of curious. Do you think, Scott, what do you think as far as when that might happen? Is that five years? Is that three years down? What do you think is the the horizon here? I think what just needs to happen is there just needs to be a few games that get it done. I think Good over deal. the course of the next probably two years, maybe three years max, you'll start to okay. see a big shift. I know for all us... Right. Once we go into global launch, and this is something that we talk about on Next Crypto Gem, if we can be the game that really helps bridge Web 2 to Web 3, because there's a lot of games that are, are very heavy on the Web 3 side, right? And most of the world isn't ready for that yet. But if we can be the game that introduces people to, you know, using a token in a game and owning your NFTs and selling them, and that's a touch point that gets them excited and then helps them kind of cross the bridge and then they want to explore these other games that are more Web3 native, then amazing. But there yeah. needs to be, like Ian said, there needs to be that 2.5 bridge to get people to cross. And I all truly believe that Wag Me Games is going to be the one that does it. Well, very cool. All right. Well, that brings it up to the last question, and that is uh, roadmap. You look at next few things that are out of the gate for you guys, and then maybe give me one of your, you know, your grand vision uh, you know, throw it on the wall and see what happens. Just to simplify where our roadmap is, we're in closed beta now. We're about to go to soft yeah. launch where, you know, we have a team of experienced guys from EA who have shipped a lot of different mobile games. So that's where we're at right now. So over the next three months, six months, that we're, we're planning on a full-blown soft launch to global launch strategy. Um, our grand scheme of things, Scott, go ahead. I'll go ahead and let you answer okay. that one. Here we go. I, I mean, I mean, the grand scheme of things is to come in swinging and swinging hot, right? So as I mentioned earlier, transmedia entertainment franchise. Once we have this anime treatment done, which we would love to share with you, Paul, as we start to work on it. And the company we're working with, we haven't announced it yet. Uh, My hands are tied. Ian has to say things before I can so I don't get in trouble. Um, But we're working with a company that's known for doing some big titles on Netflix. So to have an ongoing comic book and story with a game really helps with keeping the excitement up for these different types of live ops opportunities. Everything that we're doing with WAGME, we're not just trying to figure it out on our own. I feel like a lot of companies in Web3, they like to want, they want to stay in this bubble of these echo chambers of only Web3 people. No, when we were ready to get this game launched in January, we went to EA and we started sniping people. We got Brent yeah. Pease, the previous general manager, who is now our COO. We got Esteban Gill. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work, but I'll tell you, Paul, we have some of the most dedicated people on our team working day in and day out to make this happen. Very cool. Hey, listen, I think I like you guys' uh, your panache. I think you're in the rise. And I like the approach, the transmedia approach. I think, you know, we've seen it from titans within the gaming sector that have already, you know, traditional gaming that have been able to see, succeed that way. So I think you're right in your moves there. I I can't wait to see some of the, you know, the releases when you guys launch them. Listen, Ian, Scott, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much for coming in today. We appreciate it. Thank Thank you, you, Paul. Paul. Good for having us. Appreciate it. You bet. All right. All right, you guys are tuned in. Maybe over on the podcast side of things, you just missed a whole slew of graphics and gameplay and all kinds of cool stuff here around Wagme and what they've been doing. So jump over here to the YouTube channel. It's the best place to catch that kind of content. Make sure to smash the like button right now. Just hit it. Give us a little bit of love there. It also helps people learn about Web3 Gaming and what this might do to the gaming industry as a whole. So don't 
not give us a little kudo there. If you're not in the Diamond Circle, make sure and jump in now. It's another place you can get additional content from us. Catch me out on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.